Hello and uh, welcome to the first video in my guide to platformers and this time I've actually pressed the bloody record button. I did record this video and I got about 20 minutes in and then my video camera went on standby and I went, what the hell is going on? No, no, I haven't pressed the record button. I thought I pressed it. I haven't. So, um... I'm going to have to go back over this, and hopefully I haven't forgotten anything, because, uh, yeah. So, platformers. As you probably know if you've spent any time on, uh, on my Discord, or if you've spent time on my channel, uh, whilst I talk mainly about books on this channel, at least that's the plan, um, I do want to talk more about video games, and platformers are my favourite genre, my favourite style of video game. Um, I kind of consider them to be their own medium in their own right, but very few other people would agree with me on that. And um, when it comes to platformers, I think I know a fair bit about them. The problem is that I am spoiled for choice when it comes to explaining that knowledge to other people. I could just talk in general, uh, but I want to talk about specific games. I want to go into detail. I want to you know, share my passion. And that's a lot harder to do when you're so spoiled for choice because you know of literally hundreds of platforming, uh, platformers that most people haven't played. And um, yeah, I thought the best way to go about this would be to start a guide to platformers and start at the beginning. Now, I'm not really going to start at the very beginning. I'm not going to make you go back and play like Atari games or anything. Like You don't have to do that to understand platformers. Um, in fact, I'm going to try and start as if I was explaining platformers to people who have never played a platformer before. So I'm going to recommend games that will ease you into platforming and give you an experience that should make it so that you can enjoy uh, the, the platforming um, genre, uh, the platforming medium, as if it's something brand new. Now... The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the types of platformers. That's what this video is. So, in order to understand what all these platformers are, you, should, you need to know the five different subgenres. Because there's five main subgenres for platformers. There's, obviously, there's smaller sub-subgenres within that. Um, it's it's kind of like with music. Um, you know, you can have, you, you have pop music and rock music and metal music. And um, if, if you listen to metal music, and um, you, you enjoy a song, but you're not really a big metal fan, and then you talk to a metal fan, and they'll come up with the most ridiculously obscure, like, oh, that's, that's Finnish pirate shanty metal. It's like, what the hell is that? Does that describe anyone, ex anyone other than this one band singing this one song? Because I've never heard of that before. But, yeah, it's like that. Like, gaming has the same issue. And legitimately, you will be able to find a half dozen games that all fit the same profile. Um, so anyway, the different types, before I get sidetracked again, I'm going to put some gameplay up so that you can see what I'm talking about. The, uh, the first type is the classic or mascot platformer. We all know this. This is the likes of Mario. Mario didn't create this genre, uh, didn't create the platformer, it just popularised it. Mario is pretty great. Um, no one's going to argue that Mario isn't. Uh, it had to teach a lot of people what the, uh, the basics of platforming is. And you wouldn't go too wrong playing Mario as your first platformer. Because World 1-1 teaches everything you'd need to know. It shows you what an enemy is. It shows you how to navigate the level. Um, and it teaches you by having you do. Rather than giving you... a boring and painful tutorial. So, the Mario games, good choice. They are a bit simplistic, at least the first few are. They get better as they go along. And, um, of course, there is the obvious rival to Mario, that's Sonic. Now, Sonic didn't work in quite the same way as Mario. Mario was very predictable. The jump arc is always the same, the jump distance is always the same. If you're running, your jump distance is further, it's very predictable. It's so predictable, in fact, that speedrunners can get the world record down to fractions of a second. They can do this because 
every time you press the jump button, you know exactly where Mario's going to land, assuming you know his jump distance. Sonic is a bit different. Sonic is predictable, but the, the terrain isn't straight, and his momentum is constantly changing. You need to gather up speed, you need to build momentum, and when you do jump, the angle of the land that you're leaving will change the, the uh, angle that you jump at, and you can use this to almost play pinball with Sonic. Um, to the point where they even made a pinball version of Sonic, Sonic Spinball, which is actually not that bad of a game. I quite enjoy it. Uh, but um, Sonic managed to change the way people thought of, of mascot platformers. It wasn't all just bricks floating in space. There were a few that still did that, that copied the, uh, the Mario formula. A couple of examples include the Magical Quest games with, uh, with Mickey Mouse, and um, Sega's answer to, uh, uh, to the Mario experiment would be Kid Chameleon, which they've put on most um, compilation discs out there, and I, I personally think is better than the first few Mario games. I, f I feel it's a little bit more exciting. There's, there's more variety in um, the levels are less predictable. But um, when Sonic made waves, a lot of companies just tried to copy that. So you ended up with a lot of mascots, uh, a lot of attitude-filled uh, kind of woodland creatures just trying to look cool, like 90s cool, which has not worked, because that just looks cringe now by today's standards. You've got a few, like you had Zero, the kamikaze squirrel, which is about as bad as it sounds. There was Mr. Nuts. Yeah, you can see it. You can see what the gameplay is like. It's not a bad game by any means, but yeah, you can see what they were going for. Uh, there's uh, there's a few that were quite blatant, like High Seas Havoc, where you can tell that they're trying to make it look and feel like Sonic the way that the running goes. Uh, there's Socket, which didn't even try to hide its influence. Um, Socket didn't even try to hide the name. They've tried to make the name as close to Sonic as they can. And then there's the most obvious um, attempt to clone the Sonic gameplay, which is Bubsy. Which is about as bad as you've heard. Assuming you've heard anything about it at all. Now, mascot platformers continued. There was more. Uh, the Donkey Kong Country series is um, is probably one of the more famous uh, series, and that redefined what we expected from platforms. It put a lot of uh, a lot of emphasis on the graphics, and it was fantastic for its time. It was also crucially really really smooth and fun to play. If it was just great graphics, it would not have succeeded. But the Donkey Kong Country games not only managed to take 16-bit graphics way beyond what people thought were possible, but it also managed to take the gameplay to a new area. It felt smooth, and it felt predictable, kind of like Mario, but it also felt heavier and more deliberate, but with a, a greater sense of momentum, which reminded people of Sonic. It was a nice middle ground between the two, actually, but it felt heavier than both of them. Donkey Kong had weight to it. This style of platforming would carry on further in and more people would copy that as well. Uh, there were other styles as well, but um, Donkey Kong has been copied more recently with some uh, some releases such as Ukulele and the Impossible Lair, which is far better than the Collectathon uh, crap they made for the first game, which was bad for a Collectathon. Um, Impossible Lair, however, is a fantastic game and well worth your time. And then there's Kaze and the Wild Masks, which is a personal favourite of mine, and one I highly recommend. It's um, it's possibly one of the uh, the better examples of a linear mascot platformer that's out at the moment. Very modern, very much players like Donkey Kong Country, and it's available for pretty much everything. So those are classic uh, mascot platformers. 
Mario and Sonic are still being made to this day, and there's loads that are trying to copy what they do, um, right down to the point where they're almost exact clones. Um, some of them even start as fan games. A good example being Freedom Planet, which was literally a Sonic fan game that got so much attention that they decided if we just remove Sonic, then there's no copyrighted material in it. We can put our own character in its place and we can sell this as its own game. And that's exactly what they did, and it, it's actually a really good game. But there's more, so let's move on to the other styles. Type 2 is the Puzzle Platformer. Now the Puzzle Platformer is one I'm not a big fan of. And it's largely because I like the kinesthetic appeal of platformers. I like the flow, the, the feeling of movement, and Puzzle Platformers sacrifice that entirely. Um, they focus instead on brain teasing. Uh, the, the whole... Uh, the whole thing is giving you a puzzle to solve. So it's less important for you to be skilled at moving through the environment and more important for you to think your way through the environment. The good thing is, though, puzzle platformers tend to be a lot easier for someone to get into if they've not played uh, platformers before because you can play slowly. You don't need to be skillful. You don't really generally need to be able to do anything fast. Uh, later down the line, some of the uh, the puzzles may require you to press a button and then quickly dash past something that might be closing fast. But you can likely try it over and over again until you get it. And by the time you've finished a few of the good puzzle platformers, you'll be so used to moving that you'll be able to try other mascot platformers where there's hazards that are actively trying to kill you and you have to react in real time. So... There's a few uh, good ones that I can mention, but puzzle platformers go back quite a long way. Uh, there's quite a few of them, and um, it's largely because they're, they're quite cheap to make. Puzzle platformers uh, require very... Uh, they can be very forgiving. They require very little skill to make um, from a technical standpoint, so long as you can design a good puzzle, and you can largely do that on a piece of paper if you think about it. If you can program something even halfway decent, it can be very forgiving as a game. It can run like crap, and it can have terrible graphics. If the puzzles are worthwhile, that will be enough to carry the game. And there are some great examples of some extreme minimalism in this genre that does that. Uh, puzzle platformers go back right to the beginning, to you know, alongside the first Mario game, uh, games such as Penguin Land. Uh, Solomon's Key, Castle Quest, and Load Runner. One that I would like to highlight, as I feel it's probably the uh, the best of the bunch, would be Donkey Kong for the Game Boy. This is one of the few puzzle platformers that I genuinely enjoy playing. I think that it's it's actually quite fun to play. It's quite fun to control Mario in this game. And I think the main reason is that part of the puzzle is knowing how to use Mario's jump and Mario's like uh, somersault jump to get to places. Um, so there's a, there is a thing in this game where the movement becomes part of the puzzle. And I, I quite enjoy that. There, there are plenty of modern uh, examples of, uh, of puzzle platformers, there's games like Limbo, which um, is probably one of the more, of the more well known. There's Toki Tori 2, which is a good, you know, which is a good example of uh, a game where it gives you all of the uh, all of the abilities right from the get go, but until it taught you through level design how to use them, you won't really know how to use them. Which does mean that when you come back to the game after you've played it through once, you will realise just how much of a shortcut you can make for yourself by doing stuff you could have done all along, but you weren't shown how to do it yet. It's an interesting approach. Uh, there's Hue, which cleverly uses colour in uh, a lot of its puzzles, and um, I found that quite entertaining. I'm not sure how well it would work for colourblind people, but... I presume that a game based around colour has probably considered this. And uh, one of the more famous indie puzzle games is Fez, which despite the uh, 
at the game developer being uh, a little uh, thin-skinned and uh, a bit of a crybaby is a damn good puzzle game and it is in fact made by a single person, just one person developed this game. Well worth giving a check. Now there are other puzzle platformers out there, cinematic platformers. Uh, these aren't really platformers in my opinion. Yes, you can move from platform to platform, but you're not platforming. In most of these, you can't even really jump. You have to like lower yourself down and like dangle and then drop and things like that. Uh, examples of these include um, the original Prince of Persia game, uh, the uh, the cinematic like rotoscope uh, games, um, like Out of This World. And uh, there's another one that uh, uh, the, the name always seems to escape me. Flashback, I think it's called. And um, another one that a lot of people forget about is Oddworld. Uh, these are all fairly slow, very, very much based on the puzzles. I argue these aren't even platformers. These are just straight puzzle games that mm. happen to have a character moving in two-dimensional space. So I would just call them straight puzzle games. Now, puzzle games is going one direction, but platformers are really more about the action, and every other type takes uh, the platform where puzzle games go in one direction and reduce the action, every other one goes the other way and in increases the action, at least in some way. So, we'll start with run and gun. And run and gun games are pretty much exactly as it sounds. You have a character who can fire projectiles and you just run down the, the level, jumping from platform to platform, firing your gun. Um, the obvious examples of this include games like Contra, which is probably one of the uh, one of the earliest of this style. Uh, it was called Probotector, I believe, in, uh, in most of Europe. Um, I know it was called that when I was a kid, and yet I remember it as Contra. I'm not sure how that worked. Maybe Britain didn't get the um, the censored version because Probotector was Contra, only all the characters were replaced with robots because for some reason the Germans have this obsessive thing where shooting people was banned in video games. You could only shoot like aliens or robots. So a lot of games got censored in the, uh, the late 80s and early 90s to remove any people being shot or stabbed and replacing them with robots. Uh, and that's what happened in Contra. They just called it Probotector and replaced all the people with robots, including the main character. Um, but yeah, no one cares. Contra is now sold openly in every country and um, the, the censorship happy uh, morons need to get over it. Um, other examples, uh, Metal Slug which was uh, famous on the Neo Geo systems. Uh, not one that was easily found. It did have an arcade machine, uh, but a lot of people won't have played them uh, because, again, they weren't, uh, weren't easy to get to. And I don't believe it had home ports on any of the major systems until PlayStation 2. Um, the big name in this would probably be Gunstar Heroes. That's the one everyone's going to know. The... the... Fuck. Why did they fall over? Okay. I was half expecting to see like a mouse run out from underneath them. Because a couple of folding chairs have just fallen over in the middle of my house. Uh, but they were leaning up against the wall, they've just fallen over. Um, there's no reason why they would have fallen over. There's nothing over there. I live alone. Um, were they ever so slightly, slowly falling for like, days? 
So it'd been up against that wall for days. That's weird. The worst part, of course, is that uh, I can't go and pick them up. Because that would involve me bending down and attempting to lift something. Which is a very, very bad idea, given the, uh, the issues that I've got at the moment. Which, again, see my previous videos on my, uh, my recent trip to hospital and uh, my problems there. But yeah, that was weird. Anyway, I was talking about... Um, I was talking about games and uh, Gunstar Heroes, yeah. Um, it is famous on Mega Drive Gunstar Heroes for, uh, for being uh, the, the, tr uh, the game that the, the developer Treasure made that everyone wants. It's this fast, frenetic action game. I'm not a big fan, if I'm honest. I don't particularly like the, uh, the over-the-top reliance on shooting in this game. Um, Run and Gun is not my favourite, uh, I prefer to have more pure platforming, but um, I don't dislike it. Uh, the, um, the modern uh, equivalent of this genre, I suppose, excuse me, would be Cuphead. Cuphead is um, probably the most rec recognisable modern Run and Gun, and it is hard. Run and Gun games were well known for being very, very hard. Now, there is a line with run and gun games where they stop being platformers altogether. And I think um, a good example of this is Ranger X uh, for the Mega Drive. Now, Ranger X is um, a game where you don't really do much in the way of platforming. You, you're controlling a mech with a jetpack and you, you shoot as you move uh, through the levels. But. Um, you're not really jumping between anything, and you can kind of just fly through the entire level. It's not a shooter traditionally, but it's as close to getting there as it can be. And I would say it's a comfortable middle ground between a shoot 'em up and a platformer. Um, examples of shoot 'em ups, of course, being the likes of uh, Glee Lancer. Um, shoot 'em ups have pretty daft names by the way, yeah. Glay Lancer is not the strangest one. Um, and Thunder Force 4 is probably the most famous uh, shoot em up on the Mega Drive, or shmup as they've been shortened to in the community. There is a midpoint here though. There is a point where you're, you're not really a run and gun, but you're not quite a, uh, you're not quite a traditional mascot platformer either. And that's the point where you've got a gun and you're firing projectiles, but you're still a mainstay platformer. And the biggest example of that, of course, is Mega Man. Um, for the footage here, I'm using Mega Man X. Uh, I think that's a perfect example of a game where you're clearly moving through, you're shooting enemies, but the platforming is a huge element in the game. You could really, really muddy the line between run and gun and platformers depending on what you count and what you don't. Um, there's no right answer. Is is Mega Man X a run and gun? Is it a platformer? Is it both? It's really hard to say. Um, you could go back to the original. Uh, that is that, that seems to be more obviously platforming. Uh, and then there's, there's similar games to that like Bucky O'Hare which, again, you have a lot of shooting, but it's very clearly a platformer. Darkwing Duck was, again, very clearly a platformer. Um, but there's a lot of, of there's a lot of similarity between the likes of Mega Man and Run and Gun games in the way that you play them, because you're not just bouncing from thing to thing. You're thinking about using projectiles and firing a gun. So they play differently, and I do think that you should acknowledge that a little bit when you're planning out what games you want to play. Um, I think that's also why maybe Mega Man games um, tend not to rank as highly in, uh, in my, my mind as, say, a Mario or Sonic game. Because, again, I'm not a fan of the run and gun, whereas a lot of people were. Now, if you're not using a gun, but you are, ha you are using a weapon. Um, it can be a projectile, uh, but it's often not. 
then you're probably an action platformer. Action platformers were a hard one to categorise. Uh, action platformers are platformers that focus on the combat more than the platforming, or to an equal extent. A good example of this would be Castlevania. Castlevania is the archetypical action platformer. Uh, there's the first Castlevania games on the NES, uh, where they were fairly small sprites, um, not that dissimilar to something like Mario, but again, you're using the whip, you're throwing um, axes and things like that. It's very clear that the combat is much, much more focused and much more f in the, the foreground of the game than any kind of combat would be in a Mario game. The closest thing you get to that is jumping on the head of an enemy. Uh, you don't even really fight Bowser in Mario. So, um, I consider them to be quite different. When you get to the 16-bit era and you look at Super Castlevania, you can see that it's very, very focused. Uh, the Mega Drive uh, game Castlevania Bloodlines also extremely focused on action. There's a lot of games like this as well. Um, there's Ninja Gaiden. Um, here I'm showing the Sega Master System version of Ninja Gaiden, which I think is the superior version. Uh, the, uh, the NES trilogy uh, had terrible, um, a terrible stuttering, where the uh, the game would would respawn the enemy the second uh, the the instant you killed it. So you kill an enemy, and then the same enemy would respawn in exactly the same space. So it was as if you hadn't done anything, and it would it would be frustrating, unfairly frustrating. Um, so I don't much rate the um, the NES uh, Ninja Gaiden games, though I will say that uh, my understanding is there is a uh, a trilogy version for the Super Nintendo that has all three of the NES Ninja Gaiden games on one cartridge. And that, presumably, doesn't have the same problems with constant respawning and flickering enemies, which would make the game instantly better. Uh, there's Demon's Crest. Demon's Crest is probably one of the, uh, the best games on Super Nintendo, if I'm honest. Uh, fantastic action platformer. Technically, the, tri uh, the third uh, game in the trilogy that started on the Game Boy, but that's something to get into another time. And there's, there's action games like Hagane, which you can tell at this point Hagane is, unlike Demon's Crest and Castlevania, there's almost no platforming really in Hagane. It's all, it's all about the combat. You are jumping and you will occasionally jump up onto a platform, but you're not really platforming in Hagane. This reaches the point where you have no uh, platforming at all and people are still calling, calling the games platformers. Um, games like Shinobi, um, the Shinobi games on the Mega Drive, um, have almost no platforming at all. There's, there's, you're, you're a huge sprite, you're throwing shurikens, and um, very, very rarely do you ever jump, or you tend to duck more and dodge, and the jumping is not a skill-based manoeuvring between platforming, between platforms, it's just repositioning. Um, and then there's games like Altered Beast, where there is no platforming at all. There are no platforms in Altered Beast. You're just moving from one side of the screen to the other and killing everything that you see. It's actually a bit of a button masher Altered Beast. It's kind of a crap game, if I'm honest. But it was a very, very early Mega Drive game. Um, I would say that when you get to the point where we're at Altered Beast, we're no longer a platformer territory. We're edging into beat-em-ups. And beat em ups, honestly, is uh, one of the best genres that you can play on the 16 bit hardware. Uh, 8 bit beat em ups are a waste of your time, don't bother with them. 8 bit beat em ups are practically unplayable. Uh, the amount of sprite flicker makes them headache inducing. Uh, they are difficult to follow. All the sprites are tiny little chibi icons that just look awful. Uh, but as you can see, Mega Drive is the home of the beat em up. This is Streets of Rage 2, and it is fantastic. It is one of the best beat em ups, possibly the best beat em up that's ever been made. 
uh, simply because beat ups aren't generally made now. An argument could be made that perhaps Streets of, Ra uh, Streets of Rage 4, uh, which recently came out on the, uh, the PlayStation 4 and other systems, I have it on the PlayStation 4, is a better game simply because it's more complex and it's more refined. Um, I wouldn't necessarily disagree. Uh, there are a few that have come out very recently, but the beat-em up has only recently seen a new revival in about the last two years. So if this is something you're, you're interested in, the Mega Drive has a lot of really good beat-em ups, and it will give you a good grounding. That was the system to play beat-em ups on. But yes, um, that is the action platformer, and um, it is it is getting a lot of attention at the moment. There are Plenty of games that are recreating the style of the action platformer. Uh, they tended to be more mature in their tone, uh, more adult in their art style. Uh, it was less cartoon characters, it was less colourful, it was more um, sci-fi or horror in theme. Uh, they would often be uh, more serious in tone. They would occasionally have a, a more direct and more adult-leaning storyline. And uh, good good examples of games that have been released, modern retro games uh, that have been released in this style would be Curse of the Moon, which is a direct attempt to make a Castlevania style game, uh, and a really good attempt at it, honestly. It's a fantastic game, well worth your time. And Cyber Shadow, which is an extremely fast paced, extremely high skill action platformer that tries to take elements from the likes of Ninja Gaiden and really turn them up to 11. Uh, possibly one of the best skill-based uh, platformers that there is. But that leaves us with uh, with one more type of platformer. We've we've gone through classic and mascot. We've done puzzle platformers. We've done run and gun, and we've done action platformers. That leaves us with one more type, and that is the exploration platformer. Now, the exploration platformer is um, is very very popular. It is the single most popular style of platformer that exists today. New ones are made every bloody week, um, and uh, it started in various different places and it's hard to pinpoint exactly where it started because there were more and more elements of exploration in a few different games. Um, I think you can probably claim that the likes of Wonder Boy, uh, with Wonder Boy 3 being a great example, that has recently had a remaster as well uh, with all new, uh, all new graphics. It's playable on PlayStation I think it's on Xbox and probably on PC as well, but again, um, I have it on, on PlayStation. Um, I don't know if it's on the Switch, but I would not be surprised if it is. It's the kind of game that would be on all platforms. Um, but Wonder Boy 3 is, again, non-linear. Um, it has action platformer elements, it has um, mascot platformer elements, and the fact that it's non-linear means that you have to start thinking about it, which means that it's also, in a way, kind of puzzle platformer, in, in, if you think about it in a sideways kind of way. The only element it doesn't necessarily have is run and gun, but others will deal with that soon. Um, Blaster Master is another example of uh, an exploration pl platformer, and that, that does have guns. Uh, you're playing as a little tank, and again, Blaster Master has been revitalized and um, pushed forward for modern consumption with the Blaster Master Zero games. Uh, there's three of them currently. All three of them are on PlayStation 4. I've got those. Uh, I believe they're on the Switch. I'm not sure about Xbox, but they're almost certainly on PC. And uh, they're a great um, revisit to the series, a modernization of the series. Well worth your time. But the, um, the one that 
this genre is most famous for, the one franchise, is Metroid. Um, it's often named Metroidvania, after Metroid and Castlevania, even though we've already established in the previous category that most of the Castlevania games aren't in this category. But that doesn't seem to bother anyone. Um, the Metroid series, however, emphatically is. All of the Metroid series has been non-linear, and as you can see, there is a gun present. This is, uh, this is Metroid Zero Mission, which is the Game Boy Advance remake and the preferred way of playing the, uh, the first Metroid. Um, there, is the, there is a prequel Metroid Fusion and sequels as well, which would be Metroid 2 uh, and, uh, Metroid, and Super Metroid. Uh, Metroid 2 has recently had a remake, though I wouldn't suggest getting the Metroid 2 remake. Instead, I would go for the fan-made remake, um, which I'm not sure what it was called. AM... AM2S or something like that. It's, it's a jumble of letters and numbers. Um, I'm sure someone will put it in the comments section. Um, I think it sounds for... I think it sounds for like another Metroid 2 remake or something like that. So it would be an AM2R, something like that. Um, it is well worth, uh, well worth playing and uh, the Metroid series has been the one that's kind of moulded this, this subgenre. Uh, people expect exploration, they want to be able to find new things and because of the way Metroid did it, you find items, it makes you stronger, you develop new abilities and that allows you to open other doors and uh, go to other areas. Uh, you develop the ability to crunch down into a ball, you can go through tight tunnels. You get missiles that you can fire at a bulbous door and somehow firing five of them at the door makes the door open. It doesn't have to make sense, it's a video game. Um, a key would probably have been better, but sure Metroid, sure. Missiles open doors, we'll, we'll deal with that. Um, but these are the kind of things that we uh, we get, and these have been built up into a position now where there are so many fantastic Metroidvania, I, I don't like the term, but still, uh, games that take the style of Metroid and just run with it. A great example, of course, is one I've already mentioned, Axiom Verge. I, I firmly believe that Axiom Verge takes the styling of Metroid and does it better in every way, and it's made by a single person. Just one. Amazing, amazing game, and one you should definitely seek out. Axiom Verge is bigger than any Metroid game, more complex than any Metroid game, harder than any Metroid game, and has uh, more depth in it, both its story and its gameplay. Um, it is a, a straight improvement. That's not to say the Metroid games are not worth your time. They almost certainly are. But uh, a lot of the uh, the classics, when it comes to platformers, um, they don't hold up as well as the moderns, uh, modern games that are following in their footsteps. Uh, modern platformers are actively improving uh, in almost every area. So you don't necessarily need to go back into the past and play these old games. Some of them are well worth playing, and if you want to get that history, uh, then it's well worth doing, especially if you want to be able to go into these modern games with the experience of having played the old ones, so that you know what to expect and you understand the references. You also develop the skill, because one of the things that, uh, that modern platformers do do is they are significantly harder. It is very, very well understood in the, uh, the modern uh, indie scene and um, the smaller development scene that when you're making a platformer it's going to be people like me who have been playing video games for 30 plus years who are going to be playing your game and uh, you need to make it hard, you need to make it actually challenge us. Uh, there's no point in making a game that is as hard as say the Kirby games on, uh, on Super Nintendo we will devour them in half an hour and we will be bored in the process. So, you need to make sure that you play to your audience. It does, however, mean that some of the modern games are perhaps a little too hard to attract new fans, which might be their downfall. 
Uh, another example of a modern um, exploration platformer would be Time Spinner. Uh, this is one that I quite enjoy. Uh, there is uh, there, there's a few. There's uh, Ori and the Blind Forest, which uh, is one of the few um, games that I've mentioned that is not available on PlayStation, to my annoyance. So that's my preferred uh, place to play, but still. The, uh, the one that almost everyone is going to be aware of though, and possibly the most famous in this subgenre, is Hollow Knight. Hollow Knight is probably one of the most popular, the most beloved, and the most critically acclaimed platformers ever made. And again, it was made by four people. So... <sighs> This just goes to show that platformers are a medium that um, that defies big business. It doesn't matter if you have a big development company, if you have millions and millions in the bank. You don't need all of that. All you need is some talent and some know-how and you can make these games. If Axiom Verge can be made by one person and Hollow Knight can be made by four people, uh, you don't need to be a huge company to make it. You can just be a few friends that gather together with a good idea and a little bit of uh, a bit of oomph behind you, a little motivation. Uh, at least one of you knows how to uh, to code, and you can make a game. Uh, it won't take much. You just need some talent and, uh, and and some perseverance. So long as one person is a decent designer who knows how to design levels that flow well and feel good to play. One person is decent enough at drawing, or at least can produce some good pixel art, and you've got one person who knows how to program and can write a physics engine, you can make a platformer. And if you do a decent enough job, give yourself a couple of years to work on it, you can make a platformer that will genuinely sell. And there is a reason that because of this, they are popping up everywhere. There are hundreds of these things. It's getting to the point where I actually struggle to keep up. So yeah, these games are fantastic and um, they, have, they have pushed the medium forwards. But enough of that, I think. Those are the, uh, the main types of platformers. We have, uh, we have five types, like I say. We have a classic mascot, we have puzzle, we have run and gun, we have action, and we have exploration. And exploration is possibly, if we think of it um, in some ways, an amalgamation of the previous ones that come before. It's often got action, like with Hollow Knight, uh, cutting and slashing at, uh, at bosses with the nail. Um, some of the, the action in Hollow Knight is some of the biggest draw. Uh, it can have run and gun elements, as it does with Axiom Verge and Metroid. Uh, it often has puzzle elements in how you figure out how to unlock the next uh, level, the next area. How you transfer from one place to another is, is often involves solving a puzzle and it can even have a cute mascot uh, moving from one place to another, bopping, on, uh, bopping enemies in the head. Uh, there have been some that do that. It is amazing that they've managed to uh, to take all the various disparate parts of platformers and roll them all into one to make this this jumbled platformer uh, mix. It doesn't do any one better than the specialists. Uh, a uh, an exploration platformer or Metroidvania, as people call them, will not do um, a speed running uh, A to B level design better than a designated. Um, you know, classic platformer. Um, it's never going to be as good as the likes of Rayman at doing that. Uh, it's never going to be as intricate puzzle-wise as a well-made puzzle platform where the entire focus is on, on very tough puzzles designed to get your brain itching. And it's never going to have the same action depth as games that are built solely around the action. Or at least it shouldn't. I would argue that... Um, that Whilst it is not the only focus, the action in Hollow Knight is better than almost every action platformer and even every beat-em-up I've ever played. Um, the action is just that good in Hollow Knight. 
Uh, that's not to uh, to disparage beat em ups, that's just to say the Hollow Knight is just that damn good. Anyway, I am going to cut it there and stop rambling on because that's probably long enough. And uh, next video uh, in this series, we'll be discussing where you should be starting platformer wise. I'm not going to have you wait too long because I'm going to record these two back to back so that I can put them up a couple of days apart. But in the next video, I'm going to discuss uh, what platformers I would recommend to someone who doesn't play platformers but wants to get into them. And I'll see you next time. Bye.